Thank you uh, for sharing that synopsis. Um, and just as a note, here at Acts Reform Church, we really don't have no bells and whistles. We just open up the Bible and we teach, right? Which was no exception yesterday, right? Um, everything put in in house. Now, um, I often uh, kind of laugh when people say this is the first annual, right? And how was like yesterday? Yes, today is the first and annual. Okay, so we are continuing our study in the book of Romans, and today we begin to chapter four, yes, chapter four, in which we're going to see the example of how Abraham was justified by faith, okay? So if you are able, please uh, stand for the reading of God's word as we turn to Romans chapter four. The authoritative word of God reads as follows. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by words, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but at his, as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks to the blessings of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered, blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look to your word this morning, thank you for that clarity that you give us, in which you tell us that you justify sinners by faith apart from works, as we see in the text pointing to Abraham this morning. We ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us in this truth of being made right before you by believing in the provision of salvation that is only in Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I titled today's sermon, Abraham's Example of Faith. The last time that we met, Paul established that righteousness, being right before God, is something that is only attained by faith. There's no amount of good deeds that you or I could ever do to come to God and say, hey, Lord, have I done enough? Am I good now? Do you accept me now? The bar is infinitely high, and therefore we cannot meet that bar. That is in comparison to pretty much every other belief system. For instance, in the Mormon belief, they have a writing that says, you are saved by faith after all that you can do. So my question to my LDS friends is, when I speak to them, have you done everything you can do? You never believe it, right? The answer is no, they haven't. So therefore, by their own standard, they are not right with God. 
this is the main difference between biblical Christianity and not only all the false religions out there, but even within branches of Christianity that have embraced a salvation by faith plus adding something to it. And Paul has made it clear that we are not justified by anything that we can do, but by faith in that for both Jews and Gentiles. With that being said, Paul says, the requirement before God of perfection does not go away. Perfection must still be present. To which we say, well, we just said we can't attain perfection, so how can that be? Well, that's because the requirement of perfection is fulfilled by Christ only. It is through faith in Christ that his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, is credited to us to obtain the good standing before God. Anyone that tells you otherwise is not being faithful to the word of God. So with that being established, salvation by faith, what is Paul's intent now in this portion of the letter? Right? It's good to have up front. What is the point of Paul here? So please follow along. Relatively straightforward. This is his point in this text. Now that he has stated his point that justification, that righteousness comes by faith, now Paul provides an example of someone that the Jewish people really look up to. This is their father Abraham. This is their patriarch. And Paul says, well, guess what? Him, your patriarch, that person you really look up to, he, Abraham, was also made right before God by faith. And now when the Jewish folks hear this, now you got their attention. Like, really? Wow, how could that be? By looking at some commentaries of what the Orthodox Jewish folks believe about Abraham to this day, and obviously true back then, is that they honestly believe that God divinely made Abraham able to do everything that was required and that Abraham was flawless because of his works. And Paul is saying, no. Abraham was justified by faith. And in the text today, Paul is hoping to sort that out, to exemplify that, and to back it up by Scripture. So then, we're going to see this. The example that Paul uses of Abraham is going to show us three things. One, that Abraham has no self-merit to boast. Right? We talked about boasting last time, like this, this like, uh, self-brandizement of, like, I've done something. He says, nope, not even Abraham. He doesn't have that. Secondly, we're going to see a contrast between what is earned versus what is gifted. Okay? If you work to earn something, spiritually speaking, you are going to get your wage. It's not something you or I want, or anyone for that matter. How does that relate to the gift that God gives us? And then lastly, we're going to see that justification by faith leads to works of obedience. Because Abraham, although he was justified by faith, when he got the commandment of God to become circumcised, Abraham didn't say, well, Lord, you already justified me, so why do I need to be circumcised? No, nope. he still was obedient. So his justification was followed by good works acceptable to God of obedience. So let us look at the first three verses there to see how Abraham has no self-merit to be proud of in his flesh. The text reads, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and he was counted to him as righteousness. When the scripture talks about righteousness, let us remember what it means. It means the legal standing of a person before the judge of judges, the king of kings. And the verdict is given to you of not guilty. That's what it means when somebody is righteous before God. And Paul is taking this example to 
the most revered patriarch of the Jewish folks, Abraham. And it's essentially saying, look, up to this point, you guys look up to Abraham, Paul is saying here in his diatribe, he's saying, I'm going to show you that even our patriarch, Paul is a Jew, right? Even our patriarch, if there was anyone that could boast of being the initiator, the father of faith, the father of uh, of the Jew of the Jew race, the, the Jewish folks, it would be Abraham. However, Paul is going to show them that he had nothing to boast about. And that's what he quotes from Genesis 15, 6. And he says, And he believed the Lord, Abraham, right? And he counted to him, he counted it to him as righteousness. So that righteousness was given to Abraham because he believed God. Right? Now, by the way, what was that Abraham believed that he was told about that? Generally speaking, he believed what God told him, right? So the first question for us is, do we believe what God has said? Or do we believe what our friends, what our culture, what our favorite celebrity says, especially about spiritual things? Or do we believe what God has said in his word? So what did Abraham believe when it says that he believed God? The context is that Abram, at that time, right, he was getting advanced in age, and he feared that he had no heir, he had no child, he had no one to pass on the baton to. And if we know anything about ancient culture is that if you had no kids, that is seen as a curse, like, you don't have any kids, because you cannot pass on, you have no posterity, right? And Abraham was coming to terms and saying, looks like I'm going to have no children, no one to pass on my, my posterity, my, my, my inheritance. And therefore, he was saying that Eliezer of Damascus was going to be his heir, somebody within his household, but not his son. So under that feeling of distress that Abraham was under, under that disgrace in that culture of being childless, under that circumstance is that God comes to him and speaks to him divinely. And we see in Genesis 15, 4 and 6, what God told Abraham. It says, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, to Abraham, quote, this man shall not be your heir, meaning Eliezer, your very own son shall be your heir. Unquote. And he brought him outside and said, quote, Look toward the heaven and the number of the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And then it says, And he believed the Lord, and that was counted to him as righteousness. So in the immediate text, that is what Abraham believed that was counted to him as righteousness. That he would have a son and that his descendants would be greater than the stars in the heavens. And then later on, he goes on to express the covenant that he's making with Abraham to promise him land, to promise him blessings. Now in human terms, what God is promising Abraham is literally incredible. Abraham, super advanced in age, he's being told that he's going to have a son. If that weren't enough, that the covenant, the agreement that God is giving Abraham, that he's going to bless them with land. Now, at face value to Abraham, that would have been foolishness. No way. I'm already old, Sarah's old, there's no way I'm going to have a baby, much less a blessing of being this patriarch with more descendants than I can see up in the sky when I number the stars. That's crazy. Who would believe that? Nevertheless, it says that Abraham believed God, 
And because he believed the promise of God, that was credited to him as righteousness, as becoming right before God. Now, that has a very serious and direct application to us today. Does not believing, if we do not believe in the promises of God, that would actually seem normal these days. Believing that God is holy, that God has provided a way of salvation for us, apart from the burdens of the law, that we can be made right with him through faith in Christ alone, that our sins, our corruption, our disobedience can actually have an erasing of them, that we can be given a clean record by putting the righteousness of Christ into our account, and that we are made right before a holy God. Now the scripture literally says that that message, the message of the gospel, is foolishness. So it is natural for us not to believe it. However, to those who believe the gospel, as the Bible says, to those who are being saved, it is like becoming alive. It is the greatest news that we could ever hear. And to those that God is drawing and saving, to us it is not foolishness. To us it is the greatest message that we could ever hear. And we are told, if we believe that promise of God, that is counted to us as righteousness. Just as when Abraham believed the promise of God was counted to him as righteousness. And ultimately, to the patriarch, to Abraham, is that through his descendants, Messiah would come. was looking forward to the provision of a Savior, whereas we look back to the Savior that was provided for us. Now, when it says that Abraham believed the promises of God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, <clears throat> that phrase, it was counted to him, that means to be attributed or reckoned as an asset in someone's account. <clears throat> In other words, that's as if you have no balance. You have a negative balance in your account. Some of us at one point or another have been there. You get that little statement in the mail. Oh, that looks like an overdraft down below. <laughs> right? That's happened to me. So it's going from something like that to all of a sudden you look at your account and it's you're a millionaire. Similarly, when one believes the gospel of grace, that faith, that belief, is that terminology, is credited to us as righteousness in being made right before a holy God. Now, a key aspect of that truth, as it relates to Abraham, is that two chapters later, I mentioned this briefly in the last sermon, Abraham is then given the commandment of circumcision. And he obeyed it. He was already righteous, and he obeyed the commandment of circumcision. But he was already righteous before God. So then we see, get this, that genuine belief in God precedes any works of acceptance in God. One can do good works that seem right or even helpful to our human race, However, if those works are not the result of saving faith, in the face of God, they are meaningless. And instead of gaining favor, we are offending God even more by attempting to say that because I'm doing well, God should accept me. Our 1689 Confession of Faith discusses this at length in chapter 16. So genuine belief in God Specifically, belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ must precede any works that are going to be acceptable to God. Otherwise, they are of no good. <laughs> Moving on to the second point, it is a contrast between what is earned versus what is gifted. 
Verses 4 and 5 read as follows. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Imagine for a second that, let me pick on a brother, that Brother James is working in his office on Friday. His <coughs> boss comes to him and tells him, hey, James, I have a gift for you. Hands him an envelope, opens it, and Brother James is like, this is my paycheck. Like, what do you mean a gift? He's like, no, this is a gift. No, it's not. I work for this. Right? He worked, and he received his payment. Right? He earned it. Right? So that's no gift at all. That is what he earned. How does that relate to someone attempting to work in order to receive salvation from God? Romans 6.23 tells us plainly, the wages, the pay of sin is death. Okay. So our works before God in the context of attempting to become righteous before God are as dirty rags before him. Attempting to earn a right standing before God is sinful, therefore. And the result of that will be spiritual death, eternal death. It is an offense to God to try to be bought off, to try to bribe him by our good behavior, which is actually not good at all. So my brothers and sisters, do not attempt to pay for something that you don't have the funds to pay for. Matter of fact, you would never have the funds to pay for unless somebody hooked you up with an infinite amount of righteousness that you don't have. Only Jesus can do that. So then, there's a tremendous difference between being the recipient of a gift versus working for a payment to earn something. When it comes to God's salvation, the only method of delivery of that salvation is via a gift, not via works. That is a dead end. And notice that Paul is not condemning works. Because even Abraham, right, he, he performed good works. There's another scripture which at a later sermon is going to come more relevant in which it says that was not Abraham justified by works. Right? So we need to understand that. Scripture is not condemning good works. Scripture is condemning good works that claim that are going to earn your salvation. So the trusting person that trusts in Christ does not stand before God upon their own capacity of a paid laborer. Or rather, as a son or daughter who are given the gift of adoption into their Heavenly Father. Now, that phrase that says, justify the ungodly, in this passage, the term used there for ungodly is wicked, lawless, someone who is an enemy of God. And we are told that God does not give, does not give a non-guilty verdict to such people. Right, so how does that work? Let's illustrate that in a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 17, 15. It says, he who justifies the wicked, speaking about somebody human, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike in abomination to the Lord. And then Isaiah 5 Isaiah 5, verses 22 and 23 read, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. Here it is. Who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. So we have the seeds as a paradox. God says that the ungodly will not be justified. Yet, he says in the passage that we read today, that he will clear the guilt of those that are wicked. How, is that, how can that be? Well, that paradox can actually be solved. If we realize that God makes it clear that the wicked cannot be cleared of wrongdoing by any human merit 
or by a bribe. No, they're going to perish trying. But God, having the available payments that is needed to pay the bail, if you will, he and he alone can and will make the ungodly righteous before himself. So the wicked, the lawless, will not be made righteous by any human effort, by any human bribe, but God will make them righteous according to his goodness. So then Paul next takes a brief detour in talking about Abraham, and then he talks about King David, which is another revered patriarch of the Jewish people. And he puts David in the same category of one that believed that righteousness came by faith and not by works. So Paul says, not only I believe that, says Paul, not only was our patriarch justified by belief, but also David. So he's making this argument that there's a unified belief in justification being made right before God by faith and not by works. And to prove that, he quotes from Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, which is basically Romans 4, 6 to 8. It says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, and then he quotes the psalm there, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. David pronounces a blessing upon such men to whose works are not taken as payment to obtain righteousness, but rather as one whose account is initially filled with lawlessness, with sin, with wickedness, with disobedience, with murder. And all of a sudden, that is wiped out and that account is filled with perfection. David speaks from experience. David is saying, I am that man to whom my transgressions are not being counted against me, but I am being declared righteous before God. David had no works to boast of when he was busted in adultery and murder. So David, just as Abraham, they were benefactors of God's grace unmerited favor. So then the question for us is, as Abraham knew, as David knew, do we know that the only way we can obtain righteousness before God is by faith? Stop trying. It's impossible. You cannot say, I sin and I sin again and I just can't do it. I'm going to try harder. Not happening. It is through faith in Jesus Christ, through his perfection, that we are then made new, that we are empowered by his strength to obey, to hate sin. Not on the basis of us doing something to have to then pay to God to accept us. No such thing. We come to God empty-handed in repentance, knowing that in that case, he will justify the ungodly, which is all of us. So then we move on to the last point. Justification by faith leads to works of obedience. The first verse there, verse 9, reads as follows. Is this blessing of becoming righteous by faith, is that blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. We've been following the, thought, the thoughts of Paul. He's always going for the Jew or the Gentile. This is true all the way from chapter 1, right? Especially in verse 16 where he says that he's not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe for the Jew first and for the Greek, that is for the Gentile. So he has been going back and forth. Like, does this apply to the Jew or also to the Gentile? And here... Paul is saying that that blessing, the blessing of one's transgressions not being counted against you, that blessing is not only a benefit 
to the patriarchs, not only of benefit to the Jewish people, but also a blessing for us dirty Gentiles. Everyone is grafted into the family of God who believes. For those who follow the works and tradition of circumcision, they were saying, well, obviously that's for us, right? And Paul here is again telling them, it is also for those who are uncircumcised. Paul gives here the clue to that answer. When he says, for we say that faith was what made Abraham righteous. And then he proceeds to what I think is the punchline of the text this morning, which is the last three verses there. Let's read them now. Again, think of this as a punchline to Paul's argument for this text. He says, How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? Let's stop there. If the answer to that was, well, obviously, God made Abraham righteous after he was circumcised, then Abraham would be in trouble, we would be in trouble. Because now there's something I have to do so that God can declare me righteous. And that was what the Jewish folks, that's what a lot of people believe now. Like, I have to do something. My friend, young or old, it doesn't matter who you are. If you are thinking that you need to clean up your act before you come to God, good luck. This is never going to happen. You come to God now. So before Abraham did anything, is that God declared him righteous because he believed God. Let's go on. It says, it was not after, but before he was circumcised, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Okay, Paul is saying, no, it was not after, it was before he was circumcised. The purpose was to make him, Abraham, the father of all who believe without being circumcised. So that righteousness would be counted to them as well. Right there is all uncircumcised people that believe. It is all of us, all of us Gentiles that believe while being uncircumcised. We can be made righteous as well, just like Abraham was. And then he moves to the Greek, to the Jews. I mean, it says, and to make him the father of the circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. See? The uncircumcised, because they believe, they become like Abraham. And it says, to the ones that are circumcised, it doesn't stop there. And also walk in the faith of our father Abraham. You see, the common thing there is belief, faith. So from that passage then, the, what I call the punchline of, of Paul's argument in this case, we see that Abraham was righteous before God. That's starting premise. They could agree with that. No problem. Abraham was justified before God. Yes, good. we're good there. Then Paul says, does that righteousness of Abraham come before or after he was circumcised. Paul answers it in his diatribe style. He says, Abraham was justified before he did anything. And he's saying, look, I'm telling you that Abraham was made right before God. And God didn't say, I'm going to justify you, Abraham, but first, let me give you a list of things to go do. Nope. That is not true back then, and it is not true today. And then we see that circumcision is a sign. It's a sign of something else. He says it's a seal of what? Of the righteousness that Abraham already had. You see that? A sign. Just when we are bound in the covenant of marriage, the modern sign for that is a wedding ring. This is a sign of my covenant before God with my wife. The ring in itself carries no value, really, other than what it's worth, because it's metal. 
But it is, it is not this gift that gives me love for my wife. It's not this gift that make us love each other by God's grace. It is the gift of God that has been given to us, and this is a sign of it. Similarly, circumcision was the sign that they had saving faith. In our case, it would be the ordinance of baptism. Now, the purpose of Abraham becoming justified by faith is to make him the father of all who believe. Those who believe that are uncircumcised and those who are uncircumcised but believe. The common denominator then is between those who are righteous before God by faith and not by circumcision. Now, in the New Covenant, what is applicable to us, as I briefly mentioned, to become righteous is to believe. To believe what? Right? Abraham believed God. He believed the promises of God. He believed the word of God. So what are we to believe? If we take a quick look at John 6, verse 30, it says, This is Jesus speaking, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks unto the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Right? This is also when Jesus said in John chapter 7, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, although he dies, will live. And Jesus says, do you believe that? When they were there at the scene where Lazarus had died. Do we believe that? If we believe that, we are righteous before God. End of story. Now, from there on, our life must necessarily show that we have been born again, that we have changed, that we grow to love God and to hate sin. But that starting point is that we believe that promise, we repent. <clears throat> and that faith, based on that faith that God himself gives us, we are declared righteous before him. So we are to believe the promise of God in the gospel. What else should a person do to be saved? Nothing. To be saved. Nothing. End of story. Paul opens up the book of Galatians with a sharp rebuke. Right? To the Galatian church. Saying you have been adding works to salvation. And he basically tells them that anyone adding works to salvation essentially saying they could burn in hell for adding works to faith. Now, some, even in Christian circles, believe that other things are necessary for salvation. Like speaking in tongues, like dressing a certain way, or even that you must be baptized in order to be saved. And often when I've uh, become, not, not debates or anything, but just going back and forth with people, they say, hey, look at Mark 16, verse 16. So let's take a look at that. It says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now notice the subtlety there. If we start with the last portion of that verse, which says, if one does not believe, what happens? They're lost. So in other words, even if somebody is baptized and they don't believe, they're lost. See that? Now looking at the first portion of the verse, whoever believes, right, genuine faith, they will obey the commandment of baptism. Just as Abraham was first adopted into the family of God, he became righteous, and then he obeyed. His good works followed. The commandment of circumcision followed him being righteous. Same thing for the Christian. If we have genuine faith, we are not to say, well, the Lord already saved me. Well, what is there any need to obey him? We'll be like Peter saying, no, Lord. Like, how ridiculous is that? That's like saying to my wife, I hate you, my love. 
<laughs> that makes any sense, right? How can we say, no, Lord, no such thing? If we have genuine faith, we will be baptized to obey the commandment of Jesus. So then, throughout Scripture, the qualifier for righteousness before God, that is salvation, is belief, faith in the promise of the gospel, specifically the perfect work of Christ, his birth, his perfect life, his death, and his resurrection. So therefore, we should follow the example of Abraham. That's basically the context of the passage today. We are to look to Abraham in order to have faith in the promises of God like Abraham did, and therefore becoming righteous before God. Once we do that, the Holy Spirit will work in us to be obedient, to perform good works. The other way around will not work. We can be involved in church, we can read the Bible, we can be baptized, we could do the Don and Moody show. But if we don't have saving faith, we will perish. Those things are worthless. And as we see the state of the world and even the state of the church, as uh, Brother Allen has often stated, it could be that the primary mission field is in the pews of the evangelical church today. Because there is a lack of genuine faith. <coughs> now, shall we start out there? No. We're starting here. With ourselves, with our spouses, with our kids, with our families. And then we evangelize out. So a couple of reflections for the text today. Question number one for us. Are we, are you... Am I more faithful than Abraham? Abraham is known to be the father of faith, the father of the Jewish people, the father of the people of God. The Jewish people in the time of Jesus, they prided themselves in saying, we are children of Abraham. Well, even Abraham, he depended on God's goodness for justification, to be made right. He believed God. So may we be exhorted this morning to follow the example of Abraham's faith. When God spoke to him, what would have been an unbelievable, what would have been foolishness to anyone else, Abraham believed. Today, when we hear the gospel, when we hear the promises of God, that God can give us a new mind, a new heart, a new, a new life, new desires, a hatred for sin, that he can heal our brokenness, that he can give us restoration, and some of you may be thinking, that's, that's just not going to happen. Repent from that belief and believe the promises of God, and you will be made righteous before him. Follow the example of Abraham. Secondly, your reward for working to please God will not end in salvation. God will not accept your works as payment in exchange for his righteousness. You cannot bribe God by quote-unquote being good. No such thing. If you come to God with a payment of works, here you go, Lord, I have something to give you. You are in for condemnation. Your payment will be rejected. Has your credit card ever been declined? Again, why not? <laughs> And could have been in the most embarrassing situation where there's other people there. And sorry, sir, your card has declined. Well, if you attempt to become righteous before God by something you've done, your payment will be declined. And there's no second chance. You're gone. So we must first believe God. And then he will bless you for being obedient. And that will be the evidence that you indeed have saving faith. And then thirdly, who is righteous before God? Well, in the Jewish mind that Paul is part of the audience that Paul is referring to, in their mind, those that were righteous were those that were circumcised. Those dirty Gentiles, even within that context of 
the first Christians, okay, we'll kind of accept them, but there's something fishy there. And Paul makes the case that there is no difference between the Jews and those 30 Gentiles. Paul says they've been grafted into the family of God, and there's no difference on the basis of belief, faith. How does that apply to us today? Well, we may think that only those that can kind of show they have it all together, you know, family, nice picture frames with picture-perfect lives, yeah, maybe us or them, they, they could be right before God, but me, I'm a mess. I cannot be right before God. My dear friends, the good news is that you, especially if you're broken, you are the recipient of salvation by faith. Just as to the Jewish mind, it never occurred that those that were initially not being part of the promises of God will be grafted in just like that. You are not far away at all from the blessings of God. And he says, can you believe me? Let's believe. And if you're honest, you say, you know what? I, don't, I can't believe. I don't believe. Tell the Lord, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Cry out to him for mercy that he may grant you belief. Which is all you need to become righteous before him. And for some of us, it's a time of repentance by thinking that because we're Christians, now we're better than others, or that because we're Christians, now my good behavior is what God looks at in order to credit me with standing. Let that never be. And if we ever see ourselves, our brothers and sisters, even toy with that idea. Let's be gentle and kind and firm to each other to remind us that we are saved by faith. Not after all we could do, like the cults believe, but because we could do nothing if we believe God. And by doing so, we will boast only in Jesus Christ and what he has done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing to us this morning once again that if Abraham had nothing to boast about, David had nothing to boast about, far are we from having anything to boast about. And yet you have been so good to us that you have granted us faith. And that faith is often accompanied by suffering, as Philippians 1 29 says. And you are with us through that suffering, and you carry us through that suffering. So that as we believe in the gospel, we are made new and we are given hope that surpasses all understanding to the glory of Christ. Lord, make that true in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name.